Let us pray. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. You may have just noticed that the readings are a little different than we tend to be accustomed with here at House of Prayer. Um, Typically here, we have four readings, an Old Testament reading, a psalm, a New Testament reading, and then a reading from the gospel that usually isn't that long, much shorter. Uh, We follow a lectionary cycle, so there's this three-year cycle of readings that many churches across the world all participate in and read from, and so there's something kind of powerful often about having the same reading in our church that the Methodists are reading, or the Catholics are reading, or Methodists in California are reading, or people across the world are all hearing and reading that Sunday. Well, I've decided to shake things up a little bit for the next church year. So we're going to be focusing on the book of Luke. And so each of those three lectionary years usually does focus on a gospel, though not as intentionally as what we are going to over the next year. So each week we are going to have um, no Old Testament or New Testament reading, just the psalm, and then a much longer piece of Luke. And the Luke readings will be, for the most part, consecutive. We're going to go right from chapter 1, verse 1, on through to the end of the book. So next, uh, end of November, we'll get to the very last couple verses of Luke. Um, So there's lots of good reasons to do the lectionary the way we traditionally do it, and there's lots of good reasons to do this also. Um, I think one of the most valuable things about hearing a book like this is that we're not jumping around to pieces, grabbing a little bit from here and a little bit from there, but rather we're going to dig completely into the book of Luke over this year. And you're in luck, because if you happen to miss a Sunday, like I know most of you would never miss a Sunday, um, but if you do, Joe puts all the sermons on uh, the internet, and so you'll be able to catch them there on Facebook or on YouTube at a time that's convenient for you. Um, And whenever I'm not here, it's my hope that those preachers will also preach on the incredible book of Luke. All right, so if we're going to talk about Luke, if we're going to start talking about Luke today, we can't just start with chapter 1. In our Bible studies, we always talk about understanding the context of books, of these these great um, words from the scriptures. Who wrote them? Who were they writing them to? What was the world like back then? Um, When was it that these things were written? And so none of us knows for sure or can perfectly pinpoint Um, answers to these questions, but we have some good ideas based on our best scholarship. And most people would say that Luke, the Gospel of Luke, was written about 70 to 75 AD. So first century, about 40 or 50 years after Jesus um, was crucified. And so the first thing that's obvious is the person who wrote this book did not actually know Jesus or live with him personally. And he pretty much admits to that in the first couple of verses. Did you notice this as we read them? Um, I sat down to write an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us from those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses. He's admitting in the first couple verses he wasn't there. The Jews were amazing thousands of years ago at relaying story by telling it verbally. Oral tradition is what we call it nowadays. Um, You know how it's embarrassing when we do the telephone game where like, I tell Alex something and he tells Jeff and then Jeff tells Greg and by the sixth person we've already totally botched the story. Um, And we we think then, historically, there's no way these things could be accurate since we're so bad at it. But they were amazing at doing it. They sat around every night and would just tell the stories of other people. And so I think we can have great confidence in the reliability of these stories as we read them, even though they were written 50 years after Jesus was alive. Um, So uh, Luke was not a contemporary of Jesus. Um, He writes his story to his community with a couple things in his possession. Um, First of all, most people think that he had the gospel of Mark in his hands. He already knew that gospel was out there, and so he uses that as a foundation for his book. Um, He also has a group of uh, oral tradition, probably, that were going around that he share and that Matthew, the gospel writer, also share. Um, So there's some things that are unique to the two of them. And then, of course, he has his own parts of the story that are unique to Luke. And so he compiles this story to tell the narrative of Jesus. Um, I don't think Luke is writing a history account of Jesus. Rather, he's telling the story of what happened when God showed up in the world. And we we can see from the very beginning, his telling of the story is very different from Mark or Matthew. In Mark, the very first verse is, the story of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, the Anointed One, the Messiah. So all these big political words Mark plays out there. And Matthew does something sort of similar too. 
in the reading that Jeff read, did you hear the name Jesus appear anywhere? No. It's fantastic, right? In, in this beginning of the story, if he, and he's writing this story about Jesus, he doesn't even get to Jesus in the first 30 verses or so. Um, so the story begins with him acknowledging that he comes from a different era um, than Jesus, and he's tried to write his best attempt at an account and the story of what Jesus was all about. Oh, a quick sidebar. So Luke is the first volume um, of Luke's story, that is the Gospel of Luke. There's a second volume to this. Does anybody know what the second volume is? Acts. Exactly right, yeah. Um, so if you notice the very first, uh, first couple, or verse 3, second part, um, Luke says, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So he's writing this book, this account to Theophilus, which means um, God studier. So I've wondered if God, Theophilus is even a person or he's just writing it to all of us God studiers. Um, so the book of Acts begins like this. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven after giving some instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Did anybody, are there those that thought that was a big surprise that Acts is part two of Luke? You can be surprised. I remember when I was in college and, or seminary and was told that Acts was part two. I'm like, why didn't nobody tell me this? How am I in seminary and just now found out that Luke and Acts are the same book, just part one and part two. Anyway, all right. So then he starts telling the story of Jesus. And like a great storyteller, he can't start telling the story of Jesus with Jesus. He has to go back even farther and tell the story of this other family, this family um, around Zechariah and Elizabeth. And it seems like that Zechariah is a priest of some sort in the ancient church. Um, and in this first scene, um, he was called to Jerusalem to do his, his priestly duties there. Um, apparently, it was the case that um, priests would be localized in their own synagogue in their hometown, but every once in a while, you and your group of priests would have to go to Jerusalem and sort of take your turn doing the ritual acts there. And so that's what's, what's going on here um, with Zechariah. He and his group have been called to the temple in Jerusalem, the main worship space, and they're there to do their work. And apparently, it's time for him to go in and offer, for someone to offer the incense offering. Um, I don't know if you noticed there. So Luke likes to add humor, and we're a, a, I've found in my 10 years here, you all are, are a very straight-laced group. So I'm going to encourage you to try to put on your humor cap here. Like Jeff was on the nice list for being, having a good sense of humor. I'm going to hope that that all spreads to all of the rest of you, because there are funny moments in this story of Zechariah. So um, first moment um, that's somewhat funny, um, he's on duty at the synagogue, or at the temple, and um, someone has to go make the offering. And so what do they do to decide who goes in? They cast lots. Yes, that's a funny moment. Thank you for laughing. Um, or to say it in 2018 lingo, they gambled to see who would do the work. <laughs> so Zechariah, I don't know if he got the short end of the stick or the long end of the stick, but he's the one that goes in to make the offering. And so he goes in, and then it says, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord. It might even be good for you to Watch your Bibles to look at this. <laughs> That's another funny moment because we don't bring Bibles to church. You can pull out your bulletin, right? Pull out your on your phone. Very good. Yep. If you're not looking at other things on your phone right now, verse eleven. There appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Like happens almost every single time in the Scriptures when an angel appears, what's the reaction? Almost always, scared. So those little cherubic things we have on our windowsills right now as we approach Christmas, those beautiful little things that are, we call angels, I mean, we have to admit that probably isn't what angels look like in the scriptures. Because would you ever be scared of one of those? If a life-size, like, precious memories cherub showed up right here in the room, would we all be terrified of that? No. I don't know what angels really look like, but it's clear they're terrifying. And then the first thing that an angel always says in the scriptures is what? Don't be afraid, right? I always think that that should be a funny moment too, and it happens all the time. Angel appears, the person is terrified. Angel says, hey, don't be terrified. Part of me wants to say, God, maybe you could just make them not so terrifying in the first place. We have to go through all this liturgy. Don't be afraid, the angel says in 13, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you'll name him John. 
so much for getting to pick out your own name. You're already stuck with this one. You have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink strong wine or strong or drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. I think that's a particular like that that phrase sort of jumps out at you, doesn't it? It's a little bit odd. He won't drink wine or strong drink. Um, I think it's because, as we know later in the story, John will be quite the extremist. If, if, if you know how the story goes, we'll find out in a couple uh, weeks, ver- chapters, he's out in the wilderness before too long as he grows up, wearing camel's hair and eating bugs and all kinds of weird stuff, proclaiming that God's kingdom is actually not in the temple, but apart from that. Um, and so, crazy guy in the wilderness eating bugs, you would think he must be smashed out of his mind, right? He must be on some sort of drugs or drinking a lot. So Luke puts this in right off the bat. He will never drink. Don't go down that path. Verse 16, he'll turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he'll go before them. He'll turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make a people prepared for the Lord. And so Zechariah says this obvious question. I'm really old. How's this going to happen? And I like how he's, he's a lot more careful about saying his wife. He's like, I'm really old, but my wife, you know, she's just, she's just getting up there in age. Is that how he says it? Uh, my wife is getting on in years. He dares not say she's also really old. Funny moment, right? Because even 2,000 years ago, there's enough sensibility to not talk about the age of your wife. The angel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. But now, but now, because you questioned me, because you didn't listen to my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day when these things occur. All right, so that's bad news for him, but not as bad as what's about to happen to him. And we just, we go right through these words and we, we just read them in their sort of black and white way. You know, people are waiting for Zechariah outside that room. Um, they wondered what the delay was. And when he comes out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Now think about that moment. He just came out of this special altar room, and he just found out that he's going to have a kid, and he can't talk or tell anybody about it. Do- He's making motions. He couldn't speak, and so he kept motioning to them as he remained unable to speak. Just think about that. Think about a dude coming out of the room, and all of his colleagues are there, and he's trying to explain this without using words. How foolish must he have looked? Come on, straight-laced people. This is really funny stuff. Right? right? And they're like, what was in that room? What incense was that burning in there? Holy cow. <laughs> and then, of course, Elizabeth does conceive later on. Why does Luke, apart from, Ma- from Matthew and the mark that he's already got in hand, why does he go to the, the extent of telling this story to us? Why does he start his gospel, this gospel, the good news of Jesus telling us this story? This is an absurd story, isn't it? I mean, we, will, we pretty it up and we say nicely that this is the beginning of the Jesus story because John, his cousin, as we will find out in a little bit, if you don't know the story, you're going to find out, but John winds up being this precursor to Jesus. He goes out into the wilderness proclaiming God's new kingdom, um, and Jesus winds up taking over that kingdom. Um, and so it makes good historical sense that we tell the John story, but also don't miss the nuance of how foolish this is. And that how God works in the foolishness. God works in the silliness. God is taking two people that for our sake we'll say are 100 years old. And he's going to make them have a baby. That is ridiculous. Edna, you're not quite 100. Could you, take, could you handle a baby right now? You ready to, to take a newborn baby and raise it? No. She's just staring at me like there's no way. Never. Not only is that ridiculously foolish, 
But then his dad, who just asks the logical question, hey, wait, we're really old. This really can't happen. Then the angel's like, the storyteller, Luke says, oh, I'll just make him mute too. And then he'll make ridiculous hand motions to his friends and not be able to talk until he comes, until the baby comes nine months later. I mean, it is really foolish. And we're going to find, as we go throughout this whole story of Jesus, that God works in the unexpected and the foolish, the unbelievable. And if we can't believe that God can make a baby come from a hundred-year-old couple and then render him mute, then we're going to have a lot of trouble believing the rest of the story. So buckle up for a great story. Amen.